Today we'll be diving into two questions. The first, is science and religion really at odds? And the second, what are orphan genes anyway? Hey guys, welcome to Ready, Set, Question. My name is Willie and I am dedicated to helping you build a reasonable worldview one question at a time. Today's episode, we are gonna be watching an event that took place on the beautiful campus of Biola and it was hosted by the Discovery Institute and it's called Setting the Record Straight from Copernicus to Orphan Genes. And we've got two amazing speakers. It's a double header. If you wanna know more about how this event went down, go ahead and take a look at the description. There's a link down below. And we're going to be listening to first Dr. Michael Keyes on the seven myths between science and religion that have been perpetuated falsely throughout the years. And then the second speaker is going to be Dr. Paul Nelson, who's going to open our eyes as to what orphan genes are. So as always, please like and subscribe to my channel. Much love, Godspeed, and I hope you learned something. Michael Newton Keyes is a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute, probably most of you know. And he's also a former Fulbright scholar. After earning his PhD in the history of science from the University of Oklahoma, he won research grants from such organizations as the National Science Foundation and the American, American Council of Learned Societies. He serves as a lecturer in the history and philosophy of science at Biola University, as you guys are here today, and on the board of directors of Rachel Christie. And I think <coughs> Willie Herod is here, of Rachel Christie, of the chapter here. Um, an alliance of apologetics clubs on college campuses. He has contributed articles to numerous journals and anthologies, including Myth Number Three: The Copernican Revolution, Demoted the Status of Earth, and Newton's App in Newton's Apple and Other Myths About Science, Harvard University Press, 2015, and Systematizing the Theoretical Virtues in the Top Tier Philosophy Journal, Synthes. This essay analyzes 12 traits of reputable theories and has generated dialogue across many fields. And of course, Mike has this new book that just came out. So, thank you very much, Mike. I'm Bill Nye. <laughs> Here I am. I'm insignificant. I'm just another speck of sand. And the Earth, really in the cosmic scheme of things, is another speck. And the Sun, an unremarkable star. And the galaxy is a speck. I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck, among other specks, among still other specks, in the middle of specklessness. I suck. Did he actually <coughs> yeah, he said this to the American Humanist Association upon receiving the Humanist of the Year Award. So, he really meant religion sucks. More specifically, the religious basis for human significance sucks. Because he went on to say that, well, we're, we must be important after all because we evolved this brain over a long period of time and here we are doing science so we must have something significant about us. Well there's this myth out here out there that says something like this a big universe is a problem for Christianity and Nye is particularly gifted at expressing that wrong idea okay um, and part of the myth is well people in the ancient world who were religious they didn't know any better, and they thought the universe was really small, which meant that we, humans, are proportionally bigger in relation to the universe, right? That we have a big, our bodies take up a big chunk of the universe, that we're significant because, significant because we're big compared to, the, to a small universe. But it turns out that people in the ancient world, even religious people, thought the universe was, well, you decide. Read this quote. Think about this. Do you think the psalmist believes the universe is big or small. <laughs> okay, big, right? You got it, right? Because if it weren't big, then this wouldn't be, be an appropriate comparison, right, to God's great love, okay? Now, C.S. Lewis grapples with the way this myth kind of is uh, expressed today. Uh, first, he kind of sets the backdrop. We all perceive space as if it's three-dimensional and it, as if it has no boundaries. Now, there are scientific theories that suggest the universe is finite, but expanding. But according to our imagination, um, and the way people have written about this now and in the past, it just seems like space just goes on and on and on and on. Okay? Uh, in other words, it doesn't seem, seem plausible that there would at some point be a wall out there that said, you know, the end of the universe. I mean, not even Trump could build that wall. Right? <laughs> All right? So, 
Yeah, so space feels infinite to us, and so to the imagination. And of course, there were uh, um, many scientific uh, theories that indicate the universe was very, very big. Okay. Now, Lewis then ran through the different options. If, let's suppose we looked out into the night sky and all there was was the moon, nothing else. And then, of course, during the day, the sun. Well, if, if space was totally blank and nothing out there and it was just us, our sun and moon, and, you know, wow. Uh, Lewis points out this would be used as strong evidence against God's existence because it would go something like this, you know, no self-respecting God would have created all that space with nothing in it. And, you know, or, or, or they might say, what a boring universe, you know, only, <laughs> only a couple things in it. There's all kinds of things the atheist could say. Well, what if we find objects in space besides the sun and moon? Uh, by the way, we do. <laughs> um, well, there are two other possibilities. Those, uh, those many, many objects out there could be either habitable or uninhabitable. And then, of course, Lewis points out, it's interesting, both hypotheses are used to reject Christianity. So let's say, suppose that, um, that there are billions of habitable planets, just pretend. Okay, billions and billions of habitable planets with billions and billions of different sorts of alien species, you know. Well, then the atheist would say, aha, humans aren't special because we're lost in this crowd of aliens and we're, there's nothing distinctive about us. Or flip that over. Suppose out there uh, those planets are mostly uninhabitable. I mean, let's suppose almost, let, let's suppose that it's very extremely unlikely that there's other habitable planets, especially within uh, traveling distance which, by the way, is the case, okay? Well, in that case, the atheist could easily say, well, what lousy design. Look at all those planets that aren't habitable. They're, they're not suitable for life. What terrible, terrible design. So I don't believe in a designer because that's, that would be terrible design, right? <laughs> this is the atheist game of heads I win, tails God loses, okay? Did your older brother ever play that with you? you know, except, it was, except he was playing God in that case, right? Um, yeah, you just can't win. Um, it reminds me of back when my son was a teenager. It didn't matter what I did, right? No matter how well designed the, the family life was, you could find something wrong with that, right? So anyway, um, this is game rigging, not truth seeking. That's what this is all about. So there's the historical part of this myth that says, well, people in the ancient world who were religious primarily uh, didn't, uh, thought the universe was small and therefore humans were big and important in that small universe. That's not true. And furthermore, regardless of what the history is, the contemporary discussion over this tends to be along the lines that I described. It doesn't matter what, uh, how, you know, if, if God exists, and I think there's good reason to think he does, no, no matter how he might have created the world, atheists would find some reason to grasp and say, ah, see, God wouldn't have done it that way. As if they would be the first to know, right, how, how God would have done it, right? All right, if God existed, okay. So they're very creative at inventing ways to make God look incompetent or, or inefficient or suboptimal in his design uh, capabilities or whatever, okay. Um, okay, let's jump to another myth. Those ignorant Christians in the Middle Ages, they thought the earth was flat, right? Didn't you learn in school that Columbus proved the earth was round at the end of the Middle Ages, 1492? And finally, the dark ages of Christian uh, influence ended. How many of you were taught that Columbus proved the earth was round? Raise your hand. Yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> Actually, it's your teachers, you know, it's not your fault. Your teachers are wrong. So, and this is the way it's depicted, right? You know, the sailors were afraid to, they were gonna, this was gonna happen to them. Um, actually, Columbus was concerned with showing the earth was small, not showing that it was round. Everyone knew it was round who was educated, including the people he was trying to get funding from. Okay, so if you lived in the Middle Ages and went to a university, you would have known this, that the earth is round. Lots of great arguments for this. Um, how about this one? 
for example, that medieval students knew well, that during a lunar eclipse, when the Earth's shadow covers up the moon, the edge of that shadow is curved, indicating that the object casting that shadow, Earth, is round. Or if you go from LA north, further further north you go, here you look up to see Polaris about 15, uh, about th um, 35 degrees above the horizon, but if you go about 1,000 miles north of here, what's 15 plus 35? 40, that'd be 50 degrees, right? Uh, if you go 1,000 miles north of here, you'd have to see Polaris, or uh, Polaris would appear 50 degrees above your horizon, uh, more than halfway up instead of, you know, less than halfway up. So, yeah, um, that indicates, at least as you're going north and south, right, that the surface of the Earth is curved. So, there's a, about a half dozen of these that medieval students typically n knew. Uh, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of students. Not, you know, this is the first time in history where hundreds of thousands of people knew science well because about a third of the curriculum in the universities was math and science, which is a higher proportion than today for, for someone who's not a science major, right? So was, were these really the dark ages after all? That is full of ignorance because of the church holding it back? doesn't look like it, does it? Um, in fact, routinely I would have a debate in my classes. Uh, I taught astronomy and biology for a quarter century. Um, and by the way, right now I'm, I only teach a little bit right here at Biola. The rest of the time I'm now writing. But anyway, during those 25 years of teaching, I'd have a debate between the flat earthers and the round earthers. I'd actually make my students you know, take both sides, and, or one group, one side, the other, the other. And uh, often the flat earthers would win because uh, students today don't know a lot of these arguments for a round earth. And so after embarrassing my students, then they realize, oh yeah, those dark ages weren't actually dark. So lesson is the dark ages never happened. There were middle ages, middle between ancient and early modern, but full of light, okay? So now here's the deal. In my book, I, I deal with six historic myths, all of which, make Christianity look as if it were anti-science. And, well, if that's the case, if, if you believe the myths, and a lot of people do, that leaves a significance void because it makes it look like it's unreasonable to believe in God and to believe in God who made us, who made us special and has a special plan for us. Well, that leaves a void of significance that people want to fill with something. And people come up with very creative ways of filling that gap. And the seventh myth in my book is, rather than a historic myth about, that distorts the history of science and Christianity, it's a futuristic myth that distorts some very subtle things about the search for E.T. <laughs> now, this is the cute E.T. As you know, as this, played, as this is played out in science fiction, there's also alien that will just you know, chomp your head off, uh, and a range of possibilities in between. So, I've identified what I call the extraterrestrial enlightenment myth. It goes something like this, that if E.T. arrives, he'll be so smart that we'll want to fall down at his feet, or lower appendages, and learn from this creature in a way that would totally, well, totally re reframe thought and culture on Earth. Here's, here are the components of the myth. Well, we, everyone knows that the distances to even possibly habitable planets are vast. And by the way, when you read in the newspaper, or actually when you read on a blog or whatever, news feed, um, that Earth-like planet discovered. Well, if you read the fine print, it's Earth-like in respect to A and B and C, maybe, but not D, E, F, you know, a whole long list of several dozen other traits that have to be just right for a planet to actually be habitable, particularly for complex life, which is what is of interest tonight, right? Because if, um, uh, if you want any hope of having a smart creature, you have to be a complex creature to start with, at least biologically complex. So, so given that we know from our, uh, um, in fact, we, we've discovered to date about 4,000 exoplanets. These are planets outside of our solar system. And um, some of them do have Earth-like traits, uh, maybe Earth-like mass, a rocky planet, or maybe uh, in the 
in what's called the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold relative to the sun. But there's so many other things that have to be just right. So, okay, so that means if you want to increase the likelihood of finding a habitable planet, then you'd have to increase the sphere of uh, search space, right, from Earth. And, and as you increase it further and further and further, that means to make alien contact with us on Earth plausible, you would need to imagine these creatures ha would have to have vastly superior technology to, than ours to be able to make the trip. Does that make sense? There's a certain logic there, right? Okay. So, an increasing number of philosophers and scientists are saying that their technology would be so vastly superior to ours that if they arrived, it would be like Harry Potter world, okay? <laughs> you know, like, it would look like supernatural, like some great creature performing miracles on Earth and boasting of great knowledge and being able to solve, you know, save us from nuclear holocaust because they're just so much better than us, not only in technology, but in morality. Because according to, to many, uh, well, look, materialists have to make sense of everything, including the origin of morality. And they have these really clever stories of how uh, competing groups, you know, some groups, some within one group were nice to each other more than the out group, and, they, and that's how being nice to each other evolved, you know, and uh, uh, altruism or, you know, being laying down your life for your neighbor. As long as he's in the in group, of course. If he's in the out group, then you want to exterminate them, which leaves open the door to racism, by the way. But anyway, leaving that aside, if there were an account of morality that, um, that, that would eliminate God, uh, and it's, it's really not a very good one, but the best they can come up with is, um, well, the more time uh, that a civilization survives and maybe survives nuclear holocaust, doesn't annihilate themselves with nuclear holocaust like we might, then their, their morality must be superior to ours. So, if, so E.T. was also a spiritual superior to us, many people are saying. And that perhaps they would revise religions on Earth and, and, and lift us up to a new galactic or intergalactic level of spirituality. Um, yeah, hmm. And many of them are saying they, if ET comes, it'll be not biological life, but post biological life because of you know, the exposure to radiation in space and so on. Uh, it'd be easier to come. As e but that all assumes you can make AI become a, particularly if. To, in the eyes of many people, a conscious creature. And that's the hope of, many, uh, of some AI experts that one day will make computers conscious, or we could upload our consciousness to a computer and, and enjoy eternal life. So this is kind of a secular salvation story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and as belief in God goes down, belief in extraterrestrials is going up as a s substitute savior, whether biological or in the form of artificially intelligent life from the heavens. Now, in that chapter on the E.T. Enlightenment myth, I do uh, take a whack at the, the companion myth that AI is poised to become super intelligent and conscious. For example, Rodney Brooks, a founding father of AI, argues that um, because uh, we, have, we imagine future technology that doesn't exist yet, it often becomes indistinguishable from magic and is no longer a falsifiable story. That is, a story that could be shown to be false if, if, put in, uh, if rigorously tested. Um, but um, if it's no longer falsifiable, that means it's no, you, can, you can't really rigorously test it to know whether it's a plausible story or not because it's really a leap of the imagination. And that's really what my book is about, is analyzing scientists as storytellers. And they are good at telling stories because they're human, and we kind of live our lives in a storied way, and we want to grasp some significance, and when if, if you don't have God, you got to fill it with something, and so this is a blind, I think, unreasonable faith, or a faith that is unbelievable. Here's Richard Dawkins, Earth's leading atheist, and he says there are very probably alien civilizations that are superhuman to the point of being godlike, in ways that exceed anything a theologian could possibly imagine. Wow, Richard Dawkins said that? He, he doesn't, this is the new materialist God, ladies and gentlemen. One that evolves uh, out of the universe. Um, 
Well, there's really no good reason to believe this story, but you can, you, you have to appreciate these people really want some, you know, some, a lot of people, uh, the, uh, there's one historian of science who defines religion as the, uh, the universal quest to find someone or something superior to you that you can, you know, that will bring you up to a higher level. Um, so, let's just imagine. Suppose that one day, in your lifetime, maybe, maybe not, suppose one day, the creature arrives. And this creature is performing great miracles upon the, on the planet. Well, the atheist will say, up, oh, aliens, the aliens arrived and they're here to save us. You know, maybe we're on the brink of nuclear holocaust and we're like, yeah, they've arrived. Our salvation has come from the heavens. But it's a materialistic salvation, isn't it? If they're correct in interpreting what the creature is, right? But you see, atheists don't really have any in principle way to helping other people who maybe are undecided about what is this creature? Is it, is it a natural creature, an alien, or is it a supernatural creature? They would have really no way to help other people decide rationally whether this creature was natural or supernatural because they have imaginatively extrapolated into the future and of course aliens coming to the planet would be like the future, right? Because they had more time to evolve according to the story, right? So it's kind of like the future has come, right? To us. Um, and they have no, uh, the atheists on earth don't really have a way to help other people rationally discern whether this creature is natural or supernatural. And so it could be that the planet could be massively deceived by, about what's really happening. Remind you of anything? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, put that in your pipe and smoke it, okay? Um, now, back down to uh, real life, okay? One of the guys I quote in my book, Howard Smith, a leading astrophysicist, uh, he gives evidence against the naturalistic interpretation of the creature, um, um, that is, alien contact on Earth. And, and basically, uh, you remember I said, as you in increase the size of this search sphere away from Earth to get bigger and bigger, um, there's a point at which you're getting beyond uh, communication, right? If, if, if it's so far away, Remember, speed of light is the maximum speed limit for communication and for travel of ordinary size objects. So um, that would limit uh, any sort of contact, whether it's you know uh, communication by some kind of uh, electronic medium or or uh, by the creatures traveling here. And so he has actually developed what he calls the misanthropic principle that for all practical purposes we are alone in terms of meaningfully communicating with any. Uh, alien, if, if there are aliens out there, because of how rare habitable planets are, given what we know from scientific evidence. Of course, you can always imagine, well, because the universe is so big, there's probably some life out there. There may be, we don't know, but what I particularly focus on in my book is not the likelihood of aliens existing, but the likelihood of alien contact. That's the, because that helps me to evaluate this alien uh, or this extraterrestrial enlightenment myth, because that's all about contact, right? So. Anyway, it, it's, it comes up wanting, and I give the details, and that's just a summary of it. Michael Shermer, by the way, right here in Southern California, who's a professional skeptic, he's got to be, he founded the what society? Skeptic. The Skeptic Society. Unfortunately, he said this, any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from what? God? I think he needs to be a little more skeptical here. Along the lines of, of uh, you know, for example, technology can never overcome natural laws, no matter how advanced. Um, so, uh, for example, you can't make a perpetual motion machine, a machine that just keeps running forever, uh, that never, uh, because it's, it's run by a, a, maybe a chain of machines. This powers this, this powers this, that powers the first machine. That's impossible. So science can find universal negative statements that are true. And um, so, so there are, in principle, reasons why I don't think contact uh, it, Will, will happen. But what's really weird about this is that godless philosophy, atheism, expects a godlike creature to arrive. I mean, that's just weird, isn't it? How ironic. And um, this could, and, and, and of course, there are pockets of people on the planet who already claim to have had, had alien contact, right? Before the big public appearance, if there is one. And, and but a lot of these stories sound very demonic, actually, when you, when, you, when you look into the details of these. 
So it's kind of freaky that the that the new atheists, uh, atheism in modern day culture is becoming harder and harder to distinguish from the occult. So this is unbelievable. So I wrote a book about it. Thanks. <laughs> So the take-home lessons, there's the points. Uh, if, if you ask me questions about these take-home lessons or whatever else, it's time for Q&A, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes? Well, you last mentioned, ET, you know, extraterrestrial, couldn't um, you mention demons? Yeah. But, I mean, we know that, oh, there's my phone. Okay. <laughs> um, That's the demon. That demons are real. Yes, right. And so explain, you know, Maybe there's some kind of, I don't know, could there be a, a way that Satan is trying to pose in different ways? I don't have any yeah. understanding of that, yeah. that he is. But right. I, I am a historian and a philosopher, not a prophet. But I will say that one possible way that Satan could deceive the world is to, is to pose as an alien creature come to save us. Because those narratives are already in place for atheists and for many world religions to buy into that, they would interpret the event a little differently depending on whether you're an atheist or many of the world religions might buy into this. It's really interesting how Christianity is the odd man out, particularly because Jesus took on human flesh and died and rose again. And we have, it's a, it's a, it's a religion that is so tied specifically to God um, coming here, and, and, and also that he will come back again, uh, that expectation. And so anyone, and the Bible says, says, if anyone proclaims a different gospel, even an angel from heaven proclaims a different gospel, don't believe him. And uh, what are angels from heaven but extraterrestrial creatures of a sort? There are angels in the Bible, of course, are not an ordinary part of the space-time universe that we live in, but perhaps they can take on different forms. Good question. Next. Sure. Uh, you mentioned sort of a eschatology of uh, atheism. Would you, how would you put um, the idea of the singularity into that story? Because, you know, the singularity being this idea that if we can live just long enough, then we can eventually upload our minds into the, uh, into the computers or whatever. Right. And curiously, the singularity is bound to come just as the author of whoever's positing it turns about 80 or 90, so they're just bar they're all barely going to make it. Yeah, Ray, Ray Kurzweil uh, has a website where you can buy uh, some of the hundred, of, hundred or so vitamins that he pops each day, hoping that he'll live long enough to, to, to live out his own prophecies. Um, he's the uh, chief engineer for Google, by the way. So, um, and he, he did make some really important discoveries in AI early on, but he's become more of a part of uh, Silicon Valley's new kind of techie religion, and he's one of the, the great prophets of this techie religion. But yeah, I critique that what's called the singularity here is not the singularity in, in, sense, in the sense of the beginning of the universe, but the a technological singularity, that's the one we're talking about, that, that we will reach a point where supercomputers will become um, more intelligent than us and that machine learning will become, quote, real learning and conscious and all that. And I critique that in the book. I, it's just unreasonable faith, given what we know. So, whether the, so some are expecting uh, salvation from the heavens, AI or uh, alien, aliens coming biologically from the heavens. Others are expecting salvation from the earth, our own technology. Uh, and, and look, here's the thing. If you believe the materialistic story on faith, because the evidence doesn't support it, Hasn't consciousness arisen already at least once from immaterial objects? And yeah, here we are, right? If you believe the evolutionary story in a materialistic way. So that fuels their faith, their eschatology, that it could happen again. Uh, and so, but it's an, it's an unreasonable faith. Faith can be reasonable if the object of the faith is reasonable. And that's what Christianity is about. Next. Yes. Speaking of prophets, uh, I think of C.S. Lewis and that hideous string. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say a word about some of the things you're saying, and it seems like he anticipated yeah. this kind of thing. Happening. Yeah, if you want to really be spooked out, read this third of the space trilogy, that hideous strength. And, and it's interesting that some sci fi literary critics put it down because they said, oh, there's all this occult stuff in that hideous strength. Well, now, 
within their own literature, within atheist literature, there's this expectation that's indistinguishable from the occult. So, yeah, and in fact, in my book, I do say that, uh, that Lewis anticipated some of what I'm talking about here, uh, that, that materialism merges into the occult. Uh, so, yeah, if, if you want to really be freaked out to, in the, to imagine this sort of thing, read that hideous strength. <laughs> Next. Yes. Uh, very few people in the Middle Ages, of course, actually believe that the Earth was flat except for the ignorant masses. Right. Of those who did, did any of them actually draw maps that showed the edge of the Earth? And if so, where was that edge? Of edge in terms of flat Earth or edge? Yeah, uh, flat Earth. No, the, uh, those who, well, the, the kind of people that would draw maps would be the educated, and so they would believe the Earth is round, not flat. So by kind of, by self exclusion, they would exclude themselves from the ignorant ones who didn't know. And so map drawers knew it was round. Yeah. Yes? Could you please expand on the salvation message that uh, this whole ETI narrative is bringing to the public, the scientific part of it? Yeah. It's a, by the way, this is salvation by good works. Salvation by technological good works. That's what this is all about. So it's the, it's the, like it's the Silicon Valley hip, hipster, you know, new religion. And, uh, but it falls within the same category in some ways with, it's just a different kind of good works religion that we'll, we'll pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and the technological fix will bring salvation or nirvana, whatever. Yes? I'm curious, uh, what do you know about CERN? And I, I don't know a lot about it. I've heard some things about looking for, them looking for like a God particle. Yeah. Like well, that was an overblown kind of science journalistic uh, flourish from legitimate research. Yeah, th there's some interesting stuff there about how that makes sense of, of you know, how mass works, but it, it's, it was way overblown. So a lot, whenever you see, you know, God particle discovered, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> uh, yes? I remember uh, Jonathan Wells years ago mentioning that as the accumulation of biological and genetical, genetic information. Uh, it just shows the scientists that how, how evolution cannot explain much more. He thought maybe by 1925 or so there'd be this paradigm shift to biology where they just eventually uh, realize they're, they're not explaining the modern discoveries. Yeah, you know, Paul Wilson's gonna talk about that kind of thing next. So I'm going to punt to Paul Nelson. Next question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't know if I heard you correctly or earlier when you talked about the uh, poor God being like a poor designer. Yeah. If you explain that in your book or if you have an argument for that, but it just made me think of some people I've talked to that say the same thing about human life in the sense of your appendix doesn't have any use. Or right. Different parts of the body, you know, got, you know, that's the explanation for why there is no God. Is it the same kind of argument that you have in your book for that? Well, the, it's similar. You know, the, it's the, well, you, you sit around and you think, well, I could have better designed right. the human throat or whatever, or I could have better designed the universe or, you know. People that have a lot of spare time on their hands do this, you know. <laughs> and, and inevitably, it shows just what a lack of imagination they have and how, and how presumptuous they are that, that they would do a better job than God. And, um, and in fact, in, in uh, Dr. Nelson's class, they talk about this the suboptimal design and do a great job of the expose of that. Next. Yes. What is the, what is the uh, materialist explanation as to how non-living material makes the leap towards consciousness? And, yeah. Uh, this, this kind of ties into this, uh, this endeavor to produce this artificial intelligence that can mimic yeah. human consciousness. So what is their explanation as to how non-living material can actually develop consciousness? Yeah, they, they, they point to, to mostly insignificant changes in which complexity increases and function increases. Um, but when, like if it's done in the lab, often it's because, the hu in almost all cases, it's because human intervention. Humans, like if humans created life in the lab, it would show 
just how much intelligence it required to, to do the trick, right? Because it's very hard to do. Even it's the simplest cell is very complex. And when it comes to machines, sure, artificial intelligence is becoming more and more capable of doing, mimicking certain aspects of human rationality. But the study of human rationality itself is far outstripping AI in terms of what we're coming to understand about our own rationality. There's not only you know, logic, there's aesthetic intelligence, there's all kinds of proliferating uh, topics in cognitive science of, of different kinds of intelligences that humans have in different sub, sub, sub categories. So AI is good at very narrow uh, solutions, to, you know, because if you have, basically, AI works because it's so fast. It takes lots of data, it runs it through quickly, and it's able to do, you know, facial recognition and voice recognition, things like that. And it might be able to fake you out that it's human, that's what's called the Turing test. If, if, if a computer can fake you out, it's human, that it passes the Turing test. But that's a very low standard, <laughs> extremely low. And that's, and, and, and you know, could Satan himself mimic uh, a creature uh, coming out of a machine? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I'm not a prophet, I'm not, God would know that, whether God allows Satan to have that capability. But there's no in principle reason why, um, there's no good evidence that machines can become conscious or that Im uh, immaterial uh, biological organisms can suddenly become conscious after not being conscious. Uh, there's just no evidence for that. Um, but, there, but the materialist story has a way of duping a lot of people into believing it because there are, uh, there are um, you know, when you get things together in a more complicated way, there are certain levels of function that become possible, but unfortunately, all the examples that I know of are involve intelligence to get that new intelligence, that new level of complexity. And so you can't, can't happen by itself. And furthermore, humans, although we are intelligent and we can make things, there seems to be limits as to how much we can make a machine mimic us. Whereas God doesn't have that limit. He can make us in his image. We apparently can't make a machine in our image. That is to make it eventually, eventually wake up and become conscious. Uh, there's no good reason to believe that we have that capability. Yes. So it sounds like the culture is saying that we um, that the bigness of the universe makes us insignificant. Um, but then when I go on into and see the night sky, I really feel um, well, God's significant. Yeah. Is there any way um, that we can actually actual, excuse me that we can uh, appropriately conclude um, something about our significance from the size of the universe, or are those entirely unrelated things? Yeah, it's irrelevant. Size and significance <laughs> don't have any necessary correlation. Uh, and and it, by the way, that the Bible clearly teaches that when you look at the night sky, like in Psalm 8, you know, what is man that you are mindful of him? You're supposed to feel small initially, but then the psalm goes on to say, and yet God has, you know, given us clear indication he's communicated with us, and he's going to communicate more, as we know, as Messiah eventually came, Yesh Jesus, and did some, uh, you know, the, he was, he is the only one that can save us from ourselves. No technology can do it. Um, I feel like I'm kind of wrapping up, because we, we have to wrap up, right? Yeah, this, this... Yeah, a few more minutes. Okay, a few more minutes, okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so size and significance don't correlate. People will, look, for example, a million cubic miles of cosmic dust and a baby. Look, which is more significant? Well, of course, a baby. Anyone knows that. So size and significance don't necessarily correlate. That's the take-home lesson. Last question or two. Yes, Robert. Yeah, you mentioned a few arguments for around Earth that they knew in the Middle Ages, at yeah. least the educated knew. Wouldn't they have been aware of the Greek works like um, Aristosthenes, who calculated the circumference of the Earth? Right. And and to calculate the circumference of the Earth meant that they already believed the Earth was round, thus having a circumference. Yeah, and so, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, maybe the world's leading scientific, scientific communicator, and he is a winsome person and very good at communicating. Unfortunately, a lot of what he communicates about science and religion is wrong. Um, but he, he was once caught on, on a Twitter saying, oh yeah, people in the Middle Ages thought the Earth was flat, and then someone, one of his followers say, but uh, no, they, they actually did know it was round. And, and, uh, and, oh, he said, wasn't that discovered even in the ancient world? And, and it turns out that Tyson kept kind of backing up, backing up, but, but yeah, it, 
It was known in the ancient world, but according to this myth, it was lost during the Middle Ages because of Christianity, and then it was regained again. Wow. Yeah, wow. but that is not true. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. You had last question right here. Okay, is that good? Okay, very last question. I, I've been giving you a lot. Oh Sorry. no. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've been puzzled how the very knowledgeable people imagine that AI can exist because intelligence cannot does not consist only of computation ability. Right. No. It, uh, your identity and mine, our consciousness, yeah. depends upon an enormous accumulation mm -hmm. of memory. Yeah. Yes. And every moment, you and I, we can draw upon something we did five years ago and reconstruct what was happening then. It's all back there somewhere in the neurons, the billions of them, that yeah. populate your skull. Uh, I haven't heard any of the AI enthusiasts right. proposing how they're going to reconstruct right. that kind of intelligence. Right. And extending that question to the question question, the reality of resurrection, which is a very biblical uh, understanding depends upon not just putting my skin and bones and liver together, but in reconstructing a lifetime of accumulated memories. Yeah, right. Why are you here? You you listen to a lot of these skeptical, unbelieving people. Uh -huh. What are they proposing as as the answer to ultimately? They're dreaming of AI. They're proposing a lot of hot air. <laughs> <laughs> Much ado about nothing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. To, do, to reason, you have to be self-conscious, to, to be able to have a continuity of personal identity over time, a consciousness, so that that's what reasoning is about, to use employee logic. So yeah, it's just, it's just blowing bubbles into the wind with, with nothing in it, this, this AI. And, and remember, most AI experts are not on board with this mythology. There's only a few of them that, that, that misuse their own discipline to, to mislead a lot of people into a materialistic spirituality that is, at the, at the end, empty and vain. And that's where we'll stop. <laughs> who has been involved in the intelligent design debate internationally for three decades. His grandfather, Byron C. Nelson, 1893 to 1972, a theologian and author, was an influential mid-20th century dissenter from Darwinian evolution. So you can see he has sort of his roots in, in you know, bucking the system, right, if you will. After Paul received his B.A. in philosophy with a minor in evolutionary biology from the University of Pittsburgh, he entered the University of Chicago where he received his Ph.D. 1998 in the philosophy of biology and evolutionary theory. He is currently a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute and adjunct faculty in the Master of Arts program in science and religion here at Biola University. So everyone, let's give a warm welcome to Paul Nelson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Walt, for that introduction. Give me just a sec here to hook up. Actually, I have a favor to ask. If someone could bring this bank of lights down uh, on the wall, I'd like to heighten the contrast on the screen. I'm delighted to see a full room tonight. Um, Biola is a, is a great place. I, I, I've been faculty here since 2004, but I lecture at a lot of Christian schools, secular schools too, and there's an atmosphere here that's really singular. It's, it's unique in a wonderful way, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here talking to you tonight. So I want to describe in a half hour a puzzle that no one expected. Uh, when I was a graduate student uh, from 1985 to 1997, and the 
puzzle I'm going to describe didn't exist when I was a graduate student. It is something that was created for us by a technology that probably some of you have already used. Has anyone here done 23andMe? Okay, I see a few hands. Or Ancestry.com, similar DNA. Um, that technology enables us to explore genetics in a way that's really remarkable. But to get there, I want to start with a thought experiment, because I know many people in the audience will not have a biological background, but you know how to read, and you've been in libraries. So let's consider a remarkable library with millions of unusual books. Here it is. This is actually a library at Johns Hopkins. Um, gorgeous place. Wouldn't you like to study there? <laughs> but we're going to... It would make you feel like a student, right? Uh, we're going to use this as our, the site of our thought experiment, and let's go off into one of these alcoves and take a book off the shelf. And I ask you to tell me about the number of words that you see on the page that are unfamiliar to you. Now, your expectation is, I've got a pretty good vocabulary. I should recognize pretty much everything that's there, maybe one or two words. Turns out, though, when you start looking, Every page has words you've never seen before. Every page. So you collect them, and you say, well, I've never seen them, but I know who does have them, the Oxford English Dictionary. It's updated annually. Uh, the best dictionary of English that currently exists, it'll be there. So you trot off to the OED with your <laughs> list of odd words. And let's personify the OED very polite English accent tells you, I don't know either. I haven't seen them either. By the way, this one, this is a real word actually. It is a, uh, an adjective in our family, the Nelson family, that combines mess, heck, and a variety of other <laughs> descriptors. When something is mecky, it's in bad shape indeed. The rest of these I just made up. It's very hard to find words that, that sound like words that aren't already in English. In any case, the OED doesn't have them. And it turns out your curiosity is provoked. You start taking books down everywhere, and you see the same pattern in every book you look at. Previously unknown words in every book you examine. Now, you can fit that to a curve. It's called a rarefaction curve. Part of sampling theory. So along the vertical axis here, we have the number of unique English words that we've discovered. Now, what would happen if we were writing a real dictionary of English is the curve would flatten. So if I gave you, let's say, $500 million, and, and I said you can assemble the best team of linguists and, uh, and philologists. Tolkien was a philologist. These are people who investigate the history of English words, assemble your super team and give me the best dictionary of English that you can. Initially, your sampling curve would rise steeply, the blue one here, but as time passes, it would flatten out. And you'd come back to me, let's say, after a decade, and you'd say, this is it. This is a rival to the OED. Every word currently in English or that was ever used within this language over some set interval, we have found. And our sampling curve is going to flatten out. There just aren't any other new words to find. All right? That's not what's happening, as you'll see, with orphan genes. The curve is rising, and it's not converging. And it's rising in a way that is really remarkable. OK? Now, you say to me, at the end of my thought experiment, we don't understand the English language very well. If you count them, there seem to be many more previously unknown words than those we have already seen. OK, with this thought experiment in mind, let's look at biology today. Now, as I said, when I was a graduate student, this technology was still a dream. In the mid-90s, however, it became a practical tool. It's now, automated DNA sequencing is now so rapid and inexpensive that if you want to see your whole genome, you can pay someone to do that for you and give it to you on a thumb drive. Right? Base pair by base pair. What this technology has enabled us to learn is that the genetic universe on this planet is vastly greater in diversity than anyone realized. 
And there's an interesting parallel that we can draw from the history of astronomy in the 20th century. In 1920, there was a famous debate between Harlow Shapley, an astronomer at Harvard, I believe at the time, and Heber Curtis, another astronomer, over the size of the physical universe, over its extent. Shapley held the view that the universe was about 300,000 light years across, mostly the Milky Way, plus some other anomalous objects in the immediate neighborhood of the Milky Way, but, you know, that was it, 300,000 light years across. Curtis thought it was very much larger indeed. Now, what settled the debate was an instrument. The 100-inch reflector at Mount Wilson, actually here in Southern California, you can go visit it, I think. Here's Hubble and uh, James Jeans working with the 100-inch reflector. This is Andromeda before Mount Wilson. It was called a nebula. That's a cloud, right? It's the Greek word for cloud. It was hard to, I mean, there it was in the night sky, but in the estimation of Shapley, not this, right? This is what Mount Wilson reveals. That is, in a sense, an island universe of its own with billions of stars. In particular, Hubble was able to observe variable stars there that behaved very much like variables in our own galaxy. And to, to, he was able to extend a distance metric to that galaxy, and the universe was vastly greater in size than 300,000 light years across. What settled the debate definitively in the favor of Curtis was the instrumentation. The same thing is happening here. Prior to the mid-90s, when you were comparing the genetics of organisms, you might use a single gene, a single protein. What this technology enabled is the ability to look at the whole genome, not just of one species, but really of as many species as you wanted to examine. So that information in the United States, there's a different depository in the UK and in, in, in the EU, we have GenBank, paid for by your tax dollars. Publicly accessible, you can get in, into GenBank and go scooting around looking at the incredible repository of, of sequence data they have there. You can think of this very much like the current dictionary of genes on a parallel with the Oxford English Dictionary. Now this cur curve should be sobering to you. It's sobering to me. This shows the growth of sequence data in GenBank from 1982 until November 2016. I need to update the figure to bring it up to 2019. But this curve now has gone up through the ceiling. What this tells you is that prior to the mid-90s, we knew basically nothing about the genetics of life on this planet. We knew a tiny, tiny, tiny sample of what was actually out there. When you have a curve like this, it tells you that generalizations you made here are very likely to be wrong because your sample was too small. You just didn't know what you were looking at. And uh, as this continues to climb, the signal that it puts off gets stronger and stronger. Understandably, right? Any inductive sample depends on the sample size. So until really the settling of Australia, the discovery of Australia, you could put a proposition in a logic textbook, all swans are white, and no one would bother to contradict you, contradict you because as far as you knew, all swans were white. Until anyone who's been to Australia knows this, at the mouth of the Swan River uh, in Eastern Australia are millions of black swans, beautiful black swans. In fact, that term black swan has come to represent uh, an empirical counterexample to some generalization that you formed. This is full of black swans, this climbing curve. Enter the orphans. All right. The name was coined by a French researcher after the yeast genome was sequenced. And what surprised them was that there were many genes, uh, or that is, open reading frames, a term I'll explain in a minute for the non-biologists in the room. There were sequences in the yeast genome of unpredictable function, and there were lots of them. They looked in every respect like protein-coding genes. 
yet no one knew what they did. All right? And what surprised this group was, have to go back here for a second, it was the discovery of our ignorance that shocked them, that there were so many genes of unknown function and they had no idea they were there. So three years ago, Richard Buggs, who's a coworker or a friend of mine in the UK, a botanist there, we published a chapter in a book with Cambridge dealing with this and the editors wrote an introduction to our chapter where they say that we deal with one of the most fundamental unanswered questions raised by the deluge of new genomic data, the ever-increasing presence of orphan or taxonomically restricted genes. What this means is you find the sequence in just a single species or a single genus, but nowhere else in the biosphere. Every genome studied to date has revealed an unexpected percentage of unique genes, again, belonging just to that species or its close relatives. And this isn't an artifact of poor sampling because the signal gets stronger with more genomes sequenced. So they say, if it were an artifact of sampling, this would be, the signal would be expected to contract, but it's in fact growing. Furthermore, there's strong evidence that many such genes are functional. So here is my co-author, Richard, and he uh, uh, and a group of collaborators sequenced the genome of a, many ash species, trees, species of ash trees uh, in the UK, they suffer from a disease called ash dieback. And the English, you know, they're very fond of their plants and animals, right? And, and they wanted to find a way to combat this disease. Well, some of the strains of the ash are resistant to this disease. So Richard wanted to find out, was there something in their genetics that helped to convey uh, or to enable resistance. When he published the ASH genome in the journal Nature, a quarter, 25% of its genes were unique and had never been seen before. So he wrote a companion article for the journal Nature, Eco Nature, Nature Ecology and Evolution where he says, every newly sequenced genome contains genes with no traceable evolutionary descent. And he calls it a, a mystery, and it is. So, how are orphans determined? Well, we have a sequence of DNA and we use algorithms to pull out what we think are the protein coding genes. And by the way, in this talk, I'm addressing only DNA sequences that code for protein. So I'm not talking about so-called non-coding DNA, although that's interesting in its own right. We assign a taxonomic category, so typically species or genus. We submit the sequence to the NCBI non-redundant database. This is uh, run as part of GenBank. It is the uh, sort of the, the first approach for establishing where you might find a match as you're assembling your, your sequence. And we use a, an, an adjustable threshold in an algorithm called BLAST, Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. It's a widely used algorithm uh, that you can play with yourself, actually. And there is an adjustable parameter there called the expect value where you can set a probability that enables you to eliminate false positives. All right, you set a stringent, a stringent expect value and that will tell you whether or not you've hit anything and it found a match in this database. So this is our, our final filter here. What comes out of that then are protein coding sequences found in only one species or genus. So that's the, the analytical pipeline by which you isolate these. Now, a few more details. There's a pun in this name, orphan. Of course, you know what an orphan is. It's a child without parents, but this is an acronym in molecular biology that stands for open reading frame. And it's a sequence of DNA that codes for protein. It has characteristic features, a start site here, a stop over here, and so forth. And those features are general enough that you can write algorithms to look for them. So known genes, those already stored in GenBank, are annotated with respect to what they do. So let's take this little cartoon here to represent four, speech, uh, four sequences already in GenBank. 
Our new sequence comes in, we run it through BLAST, we get a hit on this sequence that's already there. That's coding for a ribosomal protein. That tells us now what this sequence is doing. Now this one can join the dictionary, and as you see, the dictionary grows. The important thing to notice is the sequences that are already there are not just dumped in there. Usually they're annotated with respect to some functional role. With orphans, there's no match. Right? It's just like taking a word to the dictionary. You know it's a word. You see it there on the page. You don't know what it means. You go to the dictionary, and the dictionary provides you no help. There's no character string that corresponds. So when this was first noticed by people like Russell Doodle at UCSD down in San Diego, he points out, we're stymied, right? It's a mystery. The biggest surprise in genome sequencing is the large number of genes of unknown function. So he is making this assessment here when the signal is still fairly weak, right? Very much stronger now. So he goes on in that same review article. He said, how could this be? How could there be so much in the way of unknown equipment? There are large numbers of unidentified genes that look conventional in every way. Where, the, where, these, unique, excuse me, where these unique sequences are coming from and what they do remain baffling mysteries. Now, why is this a puzzle for evolution? Well, think about it this way. Here's our basic three-domain tree of life. We're over here on this branch, the animals. We run the story back. We come to the last eukaryotic common ancestor here at the base of this domain, run the story farther back, and eventually we reach the last universal common ancestor here, our ultimate great-great-grandma. Put her in there. Now. Let's use the library analogy to see why this is a problem. Let's suppose that every book in that library traces to an Ur book, the last universal common book, and they're all descendants of that text via copying errors or plagiarism or whatever. They all trace their way back. That's going to form an expectation about what you would be likely to find when you look at the books up here at the end of this tree of descent. All right. So the, the millions of unusual books in our library were copied from the you know, red cover there, the last universal common book. So we can take a text. This is uh, familiar to you, I would hope. The work of Thomas Jefferson. And we'll mutate two words, one in mankind. There they are. Let's uh, drop an O from one, and we'll add a U. Now these are going to go through a, a sort of a nonsense zone where they're not necessarily functional, but let's let the story run. We add a W there, and we add an H here. Now these, are, now these ha have assignable functions, right? The text still makes sense, maybe not as much as Jefferson's, but we've got a, an evolutionary trajectory going here. Ancestor, descendant. Well, there's still a lot of connections between the two, and we can trace lineages. You can follow them. In fact, philologists do this. They follow how spelling practices change with English words. And when we align the letters, we get a nice signal of transformation, a signal of history that can be detected by matching algorithms. So this is how it should work, OK? Same thing with this word. Again, we get a transformation pattern. With orphans, we don't. That's why they're orphans. They have no genetic kin. When you submit them to the standard matching algorithms like BLAST, the report that comes back is no significant similarity found. The algorithm goes out into the non-redundant database. You set your threshold for, for matching, your expect value, and, and you get a report back. There's nothing out there to match that sequence. So this Israeli team, 2003, again, the signal was weak, much, much stronger now. They say, this is a puzzle. If evolution works through descent with modification, where are the kin? Where are the genetic families to which these sequences much, must be assigned? With orphans, you don't get the trace of lineage, right? They're in magnificent isolation, in a sense, and history, the signal of history has been lost. They are everywhere. Every genome examined has orphans. And when you count them, because each one is unique, their total number rises much faster than the genes for which you already have matches. All right? This German team, and again, 
this is now eight years ago, it's, it's a much stronger signal now. The total number of orphans by far exceeds the number of known gene families because of the way that they're counted. <coughs> so if we put LUCA in there, your expectation, this is a complete tree of life that's been rolled around itself so you can get it on one slide, right? You put LUCA in there, your expectation is as you go back in evolutionary time, you should find the lineages going back to the last universal common ancestor. The genetic kin should be out there, except with orphans, they're not. And because their numbers are so great, what happens is the total genetic inventory that we need to account for using evolution becomes rapidly unreasonable, unreasonably large. In every book you examine, are unknown words, and there's no reason to expect this to change. So I was an early evangelist for the significance of orphans, and I was attacked online. People said, it's a sampling artifact. It's going to go away. I gave a talk at Dartmouth in 2005, and a microbiologist right in the front row was so indignant. He said, Paul, this is just bad statistical theory. He was wrong. If it were a sampling artifact, the curve would flatten. It's not flattening. Okay. One consequence of this is within evolutionary theory itself, people are bailing out of the single tree picture. So 10 years ago, and again, things have been more pronounced more recently, New Scientist magazine, a science journal in the UK, ran a cover story, Darwin was wrong, cutting down the tree of life. And people like Carl Woes, great Micro, uh, excuse me, molecular biologist at the University of Illinois. In a paper in 2002, he said, the time has come for biology to go beyond the doctrine of common descent. And that, by the way, is his capital D. That noun is a term of disapprobation, right? It's something bad standing in the way of understanding. Craig Venter, who raced the US government to sequence the first human genome, he said, I don't buy it. There must have been thousands of recent common ancestors, and they're not necessarily so common. So he's re he also is rejecting the single tree picture, and he's not a crazy intelligent design advocate like I am, and they're everywhere. And the interesting thing about them, or one of the interesting things about them, is they play important functional roles where you find them. So this is the red flower beetle, agricultural pest. It builds its legs Kind of important for a beetle, right? To have functional legs using an orphan sequence, the flip-flop gene. If you knock out the flip-flop gene, you don't get normal development of, of legs in this species, in this insect species. And the guys who did this paper went looking and they couldn't find the gene in any other related arthropod groups. Or even within the beetles, where, this, where you would find uh, the, uh, tribolium. This little leaf hopper, isn't that great? Like an abstract painting. Um, we have a great God. Spends its life on leaves in the rain. One of the things it does to protect itself is it makes these little, they look like buckyballs. They're actually very small structures built from specialized proteins called brocosomans. It produces them in its gut, in its malphigian tubules, and then distributes them over its cuticle, they're, they're hyperhydrophobic. So it gets hit with rain and the rain just goes right off. The proteins involved in building these are unique. Taxonomically restricted orphans found just in this group. And over and over and over. Let me give you really the most dramatic example in the short time I have. Here's the last eukaryotic common ancestor according to this geometry. It's not our ultimate grandma, but she's pretty deep in the history of life, right? According to this picture, if it's true, we all, all of our ancestries pass through that node. Now, what's something that eukaryotic cells have to do? They have to segregate their chromosomes. In mitotic division, in meiotic reduction. You grab them, pull them apart to the poles, the cell divides and so forth. You can't be a eukaryote if you don't have this cell division machinery. It's absolutely essential for any functional eukaryotic cell. All right, if we go back here, what would you expect if that critter existed there would be the case for the cell division machinery as you go out into the rest of the eukaryotic domain? All the same. Exactly. All the same. Clear prediction, right? No. You look at C. elegans, very well studied nematode. You look at yeast. 
that critical cell function is being performed by species-specific machinery. And the authors of this paper at the University of Toronto, they say, this is a mystery. All cells, all eukaryotic cells must be able to carry this out, cell division, correctly and efficiently. Why should so many taxonomically restricted genes play key roles in this core process? Well, maybe there's more than one cell operating system. It's not just one that we've all inherited. You've got multiple independent operating systems that are using specific machinery for that group. All right, I'm running over. Is that okay if I take a few extra minutes? Okay, so right now, this has become a, a, a field of tremendous interest because it was so unexpected. The leading evolutionary hypothesis for the origin of orphans is that they arose directly from random DNA. Okay, so here we have species A and B. They share gene X, but each has a unique sequence that the other does not. And because you can't trace the evolutionary history to any other gene possessed by any other species, the current leading hypothesis within evolution for the origin of these sequences is they came right out of random DNA. In one fell swoop, so to speak. Now, there's a problem with that. Prior to the discovery of orphans, the antecedent probability of this happening was viewed as zero. It would be like you waking up one day with a brand new bone in your arm that there it is, and it works, you know? Okay, so Francois Jacob, a Nobel laureate in molecular biology, said the, the probability that a functional protein would appear de novo by random association is practically zero. Susumu Ono, another very influential geneticist, says it's highly unlikely that you could go straight from random non-coding DNA to a functional protein. And there are good reasons to be skeptical. I won't read all of this because I'm running over, but this author points out that producing a functional gene with a protein product, you don't just you know, hit that sequence with a magic wand. There are lots of specific things that have to be satisfied. And that protein has to have a job to do. We have machinery in our cells that is <laughs> constantly looking for unemployed proteins to get rid of them. The last thing you want is a protein without a job to do, kind of opportunistically sloshing around your cytoplasm looking for a place to aggregate, right, and create, a, create mischief. So there's good reasons to be skeptical of random origins. But I'll tell you what, the logic of evolution has driven people to this conclusion. So this is a paper published last year by a French group looking at what our called giant viruses. They have huge genomes, much bigger than some bacteria. And there were all kinds of orphans in these giant viruses. So in the portion of their paper where they ask about how they originated, they say, well, maybe they could randomly emerge from non-coding intergenic regions. Notice, for a long time considered unrealistic on statistical grounds, we're now resorting to this. Genes overnight from random DNA, okay? There's a problem. Keep your eye here on the logic tree. This is where we're starting. Think now as an evolutionary biologist. Undirected evolution is true. New genes must arise from old. When I was a student, this was dogma. This is what was in the textbooks. This was what was supported by everything that you knew about how genes and proteins came to be. Many genes show no history. In fact, perhaps the majority of genes that we're going to discover show no evolutionary history. Guess who's running the show? This is true, so you have to go over here. Well, guess what? We were wrong. We thought that was true. Turns out we were wrong. Notice what's governing the logic here. This is not up for grabs. You could go from this signal back over here and say, maybe we have reason to doubt this now. But if you're letting this run the show, your previous certainty gets buried. This is insulated from observational challenge. Okay, it's not at risk. This is an unhealthy position for the theory of evolution to be in. And I would say that even if I weren't a theist or an intelligent design advocate. When you insulate a theory like this from observation, from anomalies that it did not predict, you are effectively rendering it an axiom, or as one of my students said today, a dogma. This is not a good position for evolutionary theory to be in. 
What would design say? Well, here's, here's a prediction that I expect to see fulfilled in the next decade. Let's suppose LUCA is true. It really existed. Well, from that organism, our ultimate grandparent, we can extend a radius or a vector defined by three things. You can't die. There are no mutational problems. You can't die. You have to leave offspring. So there, there are viability requirements on you as an organism. There are no mutational processes, and there's time. That gives us a vector or a radius that we can extend that defines a sphere. Outside of that sphere, we should not expect to see genes and proteins, right? It's the clear prediction, if LUCA existed and every gene and protein that we have derives ultimately from this point, this singularity, we extend the radius, we define a sphere, and then we ask the DNA, where are you falling? Where are the genes that we find and the proteins that we find, are they falling within that sphere or outside of it? Now, this is a tiny space, tiny, in what's accessible to a designer. A designer is not bound by any material template. A designer can go wherever he wants in possibility space to actualize things. Actually, I couldn't make this any smaller in PowerPoint, <laughs> but it should be a little dot. It should be a little dot right here. And we put the question to the DNA, where are you falling? And it's a great thing to let the evidence settle the question. And what's happening right now is this space out here is rapidly filling up. And there's no plausible way to derive that from what Luca and the single tree of life picture would have predicted. And this, remember this talk, in 10 years we're going to see this signal get much, much stronger. So intelligent design and evolution, this is a place where they, they diverge radically in terms of what they predict about biological discovery. One last thought experiment. Here's a rather conventional academic painting of a doctor administering to a sick mother, rendered rather nicely by a teenager. If you know who it was, don't say. A teenager painted this, young teenager. He also painted this. Cubist landscape. He made this sculpture of a baboon with the face of an automobile. This very large sculpture outside the Daily Federal <laughs> Building in Chicago. And you know who it is. It's Picasso. The freedom of a designer to actualize is limited only by his creativity. And a genius like Picasso ends up painting with light. But those four pieces I showed you are just a sample of Picasso's diversity as a creator and, and designer. Compare that freedom, the freedom of a designer, to a deterministic templating process. It's a coin stamping machine. This is evolution, that's design. The power of design to explore possibilities is really unlimited, especially when the designer is a transcendent intelligence. So I say, this library may have surprises that are going to blow us away. And I'll tell you what, this is going to happen here at Biola. It's already happening with a friend who teaches at Simpson up in Reading. You can buy a DNA sequencing unit that's a little bit bigger than this remote. It's called a Minion, produced by Oxford Nanopore. You can plug it into your laptop. The prep, the DNA prep you can do on a tabletop High school biology, AP biology classes are going to sequence species and do it for a semester project. Right? If you have $1,000 for a sequencer, you can do it yourself. So you can see why I'm an evangelist for this. And I, I apologize for running over. And thank you for letting me have the extra time. But this is, this is exciting. This is really exciting. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. What percentage of the human genome or the human genes are orphan genes? You know? Great question. Um, we'll talk about this in class probably tomorrow. Sure. Uh, but I'll give you the, the, the short version. In uh, 2000.
5, 2006, a team in Eric Lander's lab in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, noticed that about 5% of the human genome looked to be specific to us, okay? So approximately 1,200 open reading frames were found in our genome that were not present in the chimp. And in a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they said, it's not evolutionarily plausible that that many unique sequences could have risen in five to seven million years since our last common ancestor with the chimp. So they threw them out, all right? That paper will be overturned. It's just a matter of time. The question you should ask about approximately 1,200 apparent genes present in our genome is not could they have evolved in five to seven million years, only in our lineage. It's what are they doing there, right? So they dump them out of the human gene comp basically on the grounds that they couldn't understand how they could have evolved in the time available. I'll put that paper on the thumb drive tomorrow. It will be overturned and it, it's, to me it's really a, a case where evolutionary theory is standing in the way of knowledge. Why are those sequences there? So. I don't think the, question, the answer is known at this point because I think the way the human gene count has been determined has been heavily and badly influenced by theoretic theor, theor, theory presuppositions. Hey, Dr. Nelson, uh, about a, a year ago in a magazine called The Human Evolution, they came up with this uh, study that was over 10 years studied 100,000 different species, including man and reptiles and insects, and they were startled to find that all of these species eventually come to a point where it, they all originate at a certain time. That They, they call it uh, some type of a bottleneck. You don't know what's behind it before that. But they all meet. Is there a relationship between that mitochondrial DNA and, and what they're finding these unique? There's, there's not. I, I'm familiar with that study. Uh, I haven't. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the news of that study. I have not read the original paper. But they're looking at uh, variability in mitochondrial DNA, which is a tiny fraction compared to genomic DNA. It's the DNA that we find in the organelle, the, the energy producing organelle of eukaryotic cells, mitochondria. And apparently what they've detected is a, a uniformity in mitochondrial DNA across a whole variety of species that appears to indicate some kind of very dramatic discontinuity bottleneck. Uh, it was about 100,000 years ago, I think, was the figure in the paper. Uh, that's not re related to, to orphans. Uh, if anything, it's going in the opposite direction. It says there's much more uniformity in this mitochondrial pattern than they would have, ex would have expected. It's interesting, but, but not, not directly related to this. Um, are genes the best unit of heredity um, to understand organisms? Does computer science have any other more sophisticated ways of understanding the relationships uh, between parts of biological code. Have you thought about that from a design perspective? I have. In fact, one of my coworkers at Discovery, uh, our coworker, we're both fellows there, Jonathan Wells has argued that DNA is certainly important, right? But when you, uh, everyone in this room started as a fertilized egg, right? The information carried in the egg goes vastly beyond what's present in nucleic acid. And the bottleneck at reproduction in any animal is always going to be via an egg, not naked DNA. Naked di na DNA is a wonderful information carrier, but it's remarkably inert as a, as a player. It's like the read-only memory in a machine. And I think that, I mean, I love to study DNA. I wouldn't be a crazy person about orphans if, if I didn't have that view. But I think really it's vastly overrated. So when my daughter took AP Bio, she had a, a lab where she had to scrape her cheek 
and isolate the DNA, and I still have it somewhere in my office in a little sterile buffer, it's stone cold dead, right? It's no more alive than the asphalt in the parking lot outside. So it's a good question. I think, for instance, the role of sugars in cell membranes, they are, carbohydrates have a whole variety of conformations that they can take that is information rich. So yes, bottom line, information goes well beyond DNA. Beyond DNA, there's the sugar code, and then there's now a membrane, a code within the, the cell membrane itself, right. the phospholipids and everything. Right. And there's other codes too. There's so there there are pl now? there are plenty of other codes, and there are codes that we have yet to discover. Um, so I'm glad you guys brought that up because I I do, do not want to come across as a DNA reductionist. I definitely am not. The, uh, the orphans that popped up. Huh? You know, it, um, it's a funny thing about having a new instrument. It extends our, our gaze, if you will, our perception of nature beyond what we took as certainties before. So when I was a student, people would build evolutionary family trees using a single cytochrome, a single protein, which is a tiny fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the total genetic information that an organism carries. It would be like building a, a, a history of a series of documents on the basis of a single word instead of the entire text. Once you begin to see the entire text, it can surprise you, and that's what's happened with orphans. Will the, uh, the evolutionist see mutations <coughs> as the explanation for these orphan genes, or will that become insufficient as an explanation? I think, I think what you, it, it will be insufficient. The, 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 the funny thing about mutations is if you have, let's say, a gene a thousand nucleotides long, right, that codes for a protein slightly larger than 300 amino acids, kind of a garden variety protein. When you have mutations, they will affect base pairs along that sequence, but most of the sequence will be untouched. You can use that then as a marker of ancestry, because when you put it into an alignment program, it will go to the regions that haven't been affected by mutation, notice that they're highly congruent, they align, and you'll get a signal, this protein is related to this protein, this gene is related to this gene. What you would have to have is a mutational process that totally erased the trace of history. So when I was a student, and this was first coming on the radar, so to speak, I talked with Lee Van Valen, who was a member of my committee, and I said, Lee, what's the explanation? He said, well, we need a theory of mutation that can happen so rapidly and dramatically that it wipes out the signal of history completely. There is no such theory. That's why people are resorting to genes arising de novo, literally overnight from random DNA something which in the 70s was thought to be effectively impossible. And by the way, whenever a theory is pushed to the wall and it's, and it's apparently disconfirmed, the tendency is to come, as you, as you showed with your diagram, you come back to that original theory and then you prop it up by these ad hoc hypotheses that are just there to fix the problem but don't have other general value, and that's the sign of a sick theory, and philosophers of science know that well. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you uh, think is the most plausible idea explanation for these uh, new orphan genes that have been discovered? I would say uh, that that slide that I showed near the end where you have that sphere that is predicted by evolution, but the space accessible to a designer is much greater. What is it that's characteristic of design as opposed to a natural process? An intellect can have a concept first. It's the, it's the mental construct that's primary. You say, I wanna go there, and then you actualize what you have conceived as an abstract point, and you make it real. So if we, if we think about the kinds of designs that we make, 
I remember when all of the music we had in our house was on 33 LPs. Vinyl surface with a, literally a shape, right? An analog groove, and that was read by a diamond stylus. Along comes someone and says, you know, pops and hisses, and you have to clean out the dust all the time, and never quite sounds right. Why don't we use light? And we'll use, instead of a, an analog representation, an actual shape, we'll use a digital representation, ones and zeros. There is no smooth transition between that 33 LP technology and a digital technology. You've got to make a mental leap, conceive your target, and then actualize it. So what I see is, what we're discovering is God says, you know those leaf hoppers? They're going to be in the rain and the water all the time. They're going to need some protection. They're going to need to make these little buckyballs that they spread all over their cuticle that are hyper hydrophobic, right? And here's a cool little protein that'll do that. And I'm going to give that just to them. Just to them. From a Christian perspective, my Christian worldview is God left a signal in nature for us to find. He wants us to know he did it. And I think this kind of signal is God saying, hey, I was here. It wasn't a material template that I had to slavishly follow. I went wherever I wanted in that space of possibility. And wait till you see what else is out there that you haven't found yet. So it's the freedom of the designer to actualize using his intellect, not bound by any rules, bound only by his own creativity. Um, so I, I see something that is another layer of is problematic in terms of orphan genes, because they're not just random sequences, they're functional sequences, which means you have to have some corresponding <coughs> regulatory genes that are going to tell you when to use that. You're going to have to have other regulatory genes like promoter regions that are going to allow transcription mm -hmm. to be occurring. You're going to have to have uh, assist mechanisms in Golgi apparatus to help pull the protein that's produced. I mean, it's not just that gene. You have to have a structure, a lot of assistance there to make it function. Yeah, no, you're right. There, there is a, there's a cellular logic that's presupposed. And the experimental evidence that this can actually happen, that you can go from basically random nucleotides to a functional polypeptide is essentially nil. And I, I, I reinforce the point that Mike made a moment ago that in the logic tree of a theory in trouble, if you don't go back up to your core premise, you are forced to make ad hoc moves to keep the thing alive. And I mean, we, you can see this in astronomy, the adding of epicycles, where you're committed to circular uniform motion. You can't fit the motion of Mars and Venus, but you can if you add enough epicycles, right? Yes, sir. Uh, I, think it, I, I think it was Michael Beatty who proposed, who uh, <coughs> advanced the argument for irreducible complexity. Right. And he, he made the point that if evolution is true, then the evolutionists also have to prove that new DNA is actually being created in order to code for new structures to propel the species upward to the, the mm -hmm. next. But with these orphan genes, since they are species specific, mm -hmm. doesn't that pose uh, another <coughs> obstacle for the evolutionists to, to hurl over? I, I, and so, so my, my, the second part to my question is, have the evolutionists provided an answer to the question, is new DNA being created in order to code for the new uh, structures? It's, a, it's an excellent question. And I'm right now involved with an international team. In fact, some of us are going to Hong Kong on Sunday. And one of the things we'll be discussing there is exactly this question. So I didn't have time in my little half hour talk to address this, but the total census of DNA on this planet, most of it is in viruses. 
in a, in a single liter of seawater, there are millions and millions of viruses. And when you look at the genomes of viruses, they're mostly orphans. So you have this enormous, really almost beyond imagining library of DNA, and it has to come from somewhere, and it, we only have about three and a half billion years to generate it. So every, every sequence, every DNA sequence on this planet is not coming from chemistry. It's, uh, it's either got to be in a virus or produced by an organism. And I think once we get an accurate census on the total nucleotide universe, DNA universe on this planet, it will simply be impossible to fit it into the time available. So I don't think new DNA is being created in the way that you just described. Um, because without... Without okay. it, <laughs> right, Could you get the structure? right. Just one more, one more press question. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm not sure if this question fully relates or not, but how would you explain, like, say, for dinosaurs, where we had certain animals then and not now, but how their animals would be seemingly related to them? Um, well, I think the question you're asking is about the, the narrative of design, what happened when, right? There's a history to, of life on this planet, and the dinosaurs are gone, obviously. Um, I uh, learned evolutionary systematics, the relationships of organisms, uh, as a student, and applied it myself. And actually, the presuppositions that are built into the method assume the truth of common descent. So the very theory that I want to question is taken as a given. So for instance, in arguments that birds are descended, the birds nest within the, the clade of dinosaurs, all presuppose that common descent is a fact. And I want to question that fact. So many of the assumptions that play a role in saying, you're in that family, you're in this family, I want to look at critically. Okay, everyone, um, we'll wrap with that. Let's give our speakers today a <laughs>